Yep, that's me. Bet you're wondering how I wound up here. Hello everyone and welcome. Today I answer the question, can I beat Sekiro with only combat arts? And only once. It, the title is a work in progress. First, this run isn't super straightforward, so let's go over the rules. One, I can only damage things using combat arts. Two, no stealth death blows. I'm gonna have to fight bosses the old-fashioned way. And three, once a main boss is defeated, whatever combat art I use to beat the boss is no longer available. There are a couple of other things, but really they only apply to specific situations, so I'll bring those up when it's relevant. With that out of the way, let's get into the run. Kudo gives me my weapon, Kusabi Maru, a beautiful katana that is gonna get used in some unconventional ways. Okay, rude. For once in a FromSoft game, the tutorial isn't a run killer or a special rule, because you can lose this fight and still progress. Heck, even if you win the fight, you still lose. On to the game proper. And the run is now dead. This challenge is impossible, and let me explain why. See, to get combat arts, you need to possess an esoteric text, basically a skill tree. There are five esoteric texts in the game, only two of which are available this early. And there is a big asterisk next to that. The first one that most people will get is the simple shinobi esoteric text. It is given by the sculptor after gaining one skill point. But you can't get skill points without defeating enemies. Do you see the problem? The second one is the prosthetic arts text. This requires you to pick up and equip three prosthetic tools. Now there actually are three that you can get immediately. The shuriken, flame barrel, and axe. The problem is that even after getting it, you still need skill points to actually unlock the skills. So this leaves me with three choices. One, I can beat the game normally and get one of the special ending combat arts, then do the run in New Game Plus. Two, I can just kill a couple enemies and get one skill point to get World 1 Slash, then start the challenge. Or three, my super secret plan to jumpstart the run. Why don't you go ahead and guess in the comments below how I get the ball rolling. That's not a hint, I just didn't know how else to end that sentence. I go ahead and make my way through the Ashina outskirts, grabbing the shuriken tool and making sure to talk to Inosuke and his Obachan. Then I use the bell she gave me so I can pull in a coup and send myself back to the past where I can nab the flame barrel and axe. Like I said before though, even with the text, I'm not able to get any combat arts. It's actually even worse here because Nightjar Slash, the first combat art in this tree, isn't the first skill in the whole tree. So I think it's time to put my plan into action. Who's up for some sushi? I head back to Hirata Estate where I dice up four fish for their scales and grab a fifth one next to the bridge, then use all five to buy the floating passage text which will allow me to use the floating passage combat art. Yes, I am aware that I had to swing my sword normally in order to do this. I just thought it was more inventive than beating up regular dudes. Also, because I know someone will comment this, yes, I am also aware you can bait the snake eyes mortar enemy in Ashina outskirts to blow up these guys for some experience. It's extremely tedious and the risk of making a mistake is fairly high, but technically this is a method that will allow you to farm the single skill point necessary for Whirlwind Slash. So if you want to bomb the comments with Run Invalid, it's cool with me. While you're down there though, don't forget to like and subscribe. I'm trying to hit 100,000 by the end of this year and it would be amazing if you could help out with that happening. Floating Passage is a pretty cool looking combat art. It's essentially Genichiro's combo, except way less effective. The biggest reason why it's a problem is because some enemies have hyper armor attacks and this locks you into a few slashes. I'm sure this won't be a constant problem throughout the run. Dying to the first mini boss does not give me high hopes. This nice lady here told me I was resurrected by the dragon's blood. Now I get why this game is called Shadows Die Twice, but it begs the question, what happens if I never die once? After a few more enemies are taken out, I get my one skill point and the sculptor rewards me with a shinobi esoteric text, which I can then read and learn whirlwind slash from. Technically, it was necessary to get this or any other second skill because should I beat Gyobu with only one skill left? By my rules, the run would not be able to progress. I'm sure I'll never run into that mistake, ha <laughs> ha! Nah, I have enough foresight to plan around that. Or do I? Oh boy, a mini boss that doesn't flinch and relies heavily on grabs that have to be dodged while I'm using an attack that forces me to be a stationary target. I wonder how this is gonna end. Surprisingly, it only took me three tries to beat the ogre. I'm probably not gonna mention most of the mini bosses in this run unless they are particularly difficult, especially because there are a lot of repeats. Case in point, General Tenzin Yamauchi. There are at least four of these general enemies in the game and they all have the same moveset, albeit sometimes a little faster, so there's no point in talking about each one. Oh dear viewer, is that a massive snake or are you just happy to see me? Alright, first major boss up, Gyobu Oniwa. Oh sorry, did you want to introduce yourself? My mistake. I wasn't overly concerned about this fight going in because while Gyobu's attacks can be pretty fast, he also leaves himself wide open at the end of his combos. Why he's the gate guardian, I'll never know. Uh, you okay, Gyobu? Turned over a new leaf? Don't want to fight anymore? Yeah, you almost got me! How <laughs> Gyobu, always the trickster. There are several enemies in the game that if you perfect deflect the final hit in their combo, they will be vulnerable for a few seconds. And fortunately, Gyobu's one of them. 
With him dead, floating passage falls as well, but with the experience I got from him, I nab Nightjar Slash. I then head over to the nearby tower and meet up with Tengu, who is essential to the run. He gives me a task to eliminate some rats, which sounds easy enough. Oh, that's right, these enemies have hat shields. I forgot. I spent like five minutes running around in circles waiting for them to do a grab attack so I could get one hit in, only to realize I can just disengage and wait for them to reset for an easy attack opportunity. After channeling my inner Dale Gribble, I return to Tengu who gives me the Ashina Esoteric Text. I don't plan on getting anything from it soon, but the first skill is a combat art, so should I need a quick additional one, it's good to have. Next mini boss up is the Blazing Bull. Now, last video I complained a lot about this fight. The two pieces of advice I got were to either just run behind him or face him head on with the flex. The former is how I normally handle this fight, and it works, maybe not well, but it works. But this time I thought I would try to deflect his attacks. It's absolutely the way to go. I still hate that I take chip damage because of the fire, but it's a small price to pay, I guess. I use Nightjar Slash for this, which is actually extra perfect because it basically homes straight in on his head and is insanely fast. Before long, I have invented Yakiniku. The game world opens up a bit now, but for me, the only choice is to head straight to Simpo Temple. Standing in my way is IRL me. This fight took four minutes. I mean, I'm playing extremely conservatively, just running away and getting a shot in after his perilous attacks, but still, four minutes on a regular enemy is not okay. Through the dungeon, I emerge in a beautiful mountain valley inhabited by men that say they want peace, but have prepared for war. I gained a few levels while I was here, not strictly speaking on purpose, it was more that I would make it all the way to the end of the area than die and have to do it all over again. More than once. Ah well, I know later I'll actually need levels, so it's fine. Time to fight the physical incarnation of a strength main. Yep, that tracks. Fun fact, the Armored Warrior is actually the enemy that changed the rule set of this run. Initially, I had planned to only allow myself to deal a death blow when the enemy's HP hit zero, not from posture breaks. That was to offset how frequently deflects would be used, but as you can see, my sword swings do absolutely nothing to this boss. To my knowledge, there is no way to directly hurt him, you can only build up his posture. So, thanks Armored Warrior for being an armored thorn in my side here. Ah, who am I kidding? Being able to death blow from posture breaks makes this run just a tiny bit easier. These guys are pretty tough, so I'm going to show you all the 100% best method for handling these enemies. I legit don't think I have ever fought them. At the end of this long winding path is my prize, the Simpo Esoteric Text. This skill tree is tied with the Ashina one for having the least amount of nodes, but it has one advantage here in that there are four combat arts as opposed to three. As a bonus, you're only required to take one non-combat art skill for the whole thing. So, I do the logical thing of immediately maxing out the skill tree. I am absolutely ready to throw hands. I've completed as much of this area as I can for the time being, so I decide to backtrack and return to my roots. My home, if you will. <laughs> Unfortunately, there is a man inside of my home, and no matter how much I ask, he won't leave. I hate this lone shadow. As an enemy type, they are really fun to fight, but this arena sucks so hard. My first few attempts, I tried to use praying strikes on him. It didn't work out so well. After a couple more attempts, I switched over to the leaving kicks, and it worked about as crappily, but I will say it is extremely satisfying to jump over his sweeps and come crushing down with a force of a thousand thighs. Unfortunately, like a casual, he wasn't into that and shut me down. I switched to Whirlwind Slash, which is way, way better for a reason that I'll explain later. Also, fun fact, the uneven ground in this arena can cause his follow-up kick to go over your head. That's just stupid. Anyway, Lone Shadow Longswordsman can suck my longsword. Sure hope I don't have to fight two of these guys at once, I don't think I can handle that. Tell me, wise old lady, what is at the bottom of this hole? Did I just get one shot by Snake Eyes? Yeah, maybe I'm not supposed to come this way yet. Ashina Castle is the direction the game wants me to go in anyway, so I'll just head there. In the highest room of the tallest tower, I find Genichiro, and I am ready for some payback. I decided to go with High Monk for this because it is a long combo attack and those work best against enemies that can deflect. Keep that in mind for later because I forgot. So High Monk is a leaving kick into two roundhouse kicks followed by two sword slashes ending with a final kick. However, even after all six of those attacks connected, his health didn't move. Not even the sword slashes caused chip damage to him. What that means is that if my attacks don't connect directly, this becomes an extremely long drawn out battle of trying to build his posture meter. I'm sure not excited for the Corrupted Monk, I tell you what. I'm so happy that From Software made it to where at different health thresholds their posture recharge rate changes, it's pretty much the only thing that made this doable, or rather tolerable. Also, it was at this point I decided screw not having Makiti counter, that was just a dumb arbitrary decision I made. 
As for the actual fight, phase 1 and 2 are honestly unremarkable. I literally just spammed High Monk hoping some of the hits would connect to lower his HP. I noticed that if I'm right next to him, I can actually hit him with a rising hit of the first kick. Or if I was far away, I could graze him with my toe and it wouldn't cause him to deflect. I never really took advantage of those, but it's a thing. In a normal playthrough, I just dodged to the side of his jumping attack, opening him up for some damage, but here it's better to deflect and then step on his sword. Phase 3 is... Well, not as free as it normally is. Getting hit by lightning is basically a death sentence, but it's not terribly hard to run around him when he does it. The problem is noticing early enough in his animation that that's what he's going for. In the end, things got real scary. I foolishly jumped into his combo, which should have killed me, but thankfully the first hit staggered him out of it, then he shot a lightning arrow at me that I miraculously dodged. Looking at how full his posture bar was and how low my health bar was, I decided I would just press the attack. He ended up sending another lightning arrow my way just to get my heart rate up. In the end though, he went for a jumping attack and one well-timed parry was all it took. With that, High Monk is off the table. Also, Genichiro is dead. You look... not so strong. I bet I could take you in a one-on-one. -on -one. Making my way to the back of the castle, I run into my old friend Tengu who asks if I have mastered any secret techniques. Upon telling him that I have, he gives me the Mushin Esoteric Tax, the final skill tree. It's basically the super skill tree, and right now I don't have the ability to unlock anything, so I head back to Simpo Temple. The boss here is... Well, a boss in name only, so it's a chance to burn one of the more useless combat arts for free experience. After using some of the Simpo arts, I figure Leaping Kicks, which is just High Monk Light, would be the best bet. The White Robed Monkey is easy enough. I say as I throw myself around like four times before hitting him. The next monkey is the green one because his dumbass went straight to the bell. Then the purple one who also has room temp IQ and went straight to his death in the dark room. The last is the orange monkey who proved to be a bit of a problem. Not because he's like a secret gorilla or anything, but because hitting him with this combat art on these sloped surfaces is just so inconsistent. After no joke, five minutes of chasing this stupid monkey, it's finally over and Leaping Kicks is dead to me. So in addition to a little experience and increased attack power, I really wanted to come here for the Mortal Blade because Mortal Draw is actually broken. It's straight up the alpha version of Elden Ring's Rivers of Blood. I have a few ideas of what I'll use Mortal Draw on, but I really need to be careful because it's basically a freebie. I head back to the depths and face my old friend Snake Eyes. Using Whirlwind Slash, I was able to find the strat. Attack once, then parry her follow-up. That is literally the gameplay loop of a normal run. Spamming attacks here is bad because the timing of Whirlwind Slash and her grab just do not go together. Trust me, I learned the hard way when she no you'd me about the thing I asked her to do the other day. The real actual key here is attacking her immediately after you deflect something. As far as I can tell, except for the grab, she doesn't have anything that will hyper armor through it, so she'll just take steady chip damage. Now, let me show you why I always come this way first. Because you can skip the duo 8 fight if you do. Good old Miss Noble. I really need to find a run that makes this boss challenging, maybe beating the game without touching the controller. Spoiler alert, the Mibu villagers are going to become my Auburn Eriks later in this run. Odin of the Water. This is a cool mini boss. She has this spinning, floating moveset, and I wish there were more enemies like this in the game. Can we cut that out? I also decided prior to this to unlock midair combat arts. I have a specific reason in mind for it, but it also allows me to get a few extra shots in when I jump over sweeps. Oh, corrupted monk. I remember this fight giving me so much trouble on my first playthrough. Her posture bar is absolutely massive, so you're supposed to lower her health first to slow its recovery. The problem right now is I'm trying to slap her with my hands, doing very little or literally no damage. But she is a big target and will cancel her attacks to deflect mine. So on the one hand, no damage, but on the other hand, reliable attack opportunities. In the end, I decided it wasn't worth it and switched to Nightjar Slash, which is so underrated it's not even funny. She can still deflect the attacks, but the overall damage of a single sword slash is equal to the full combo of praying strikes. Beyond that though, it lets me quickly close the distance and has practically no ending lag so I can react to whatever she does. Even her combo finishers that do the cool push wolf away animation don't matter because I can just front flip into her face. I tried about 5 times with praying strikes and never got her below like 80% health, but first tried her with Nightjar Slash. My only regret is not learning how amazing it is sooner. At this point, I figured it would be a good idea to go get some of the prayer beads that I skipped. So first, I dive into the nearby lake for one, then again at the Simpo Temple, then take out the absolute easiest mini-boss in the game, Shikibu Yamauchi, followed by this long arm man that escaped from my dungeon, and lastly, Tokujiro the Glut. I hate this game. With another prayer bead necklace under my belt, I make my way to the gun fort. Hey Snake Eyes, I'm not scared of you, I just gotta spin the wind. I see another one has escaped the dungeon. I was initially going to go straight to Guardian Ape, but I decided to clear Hirata Estate to set up for later. Stalling? What? No, I'm not stalling, it's a tactical decision. Juzo is... 
Well, I mean, he's here. He's just an earlier version of a fight I already did. And having Blue Shirt back me up makes it a cakewalk. Unfortunately, I was not able to save him from his ultimate demise of being flattened by a shirtless man. I then quickly grab the hidden prayer bead, and it's finally time to spank the monkey, also guardian ape. So, in my endless hubris, I thought it would be smart to use Praying Strikes Exorcism here. My delusional reasoning being that the monkey doesn't deflect, so every strike should do direct vitality damage. The problem is, this ain't got no range. Combine that with the fact that when they do connect, I'm doing about as much damage as I would if I was wearing sock and boppers, which I can assure you is not more fun than a pillow fight. Fun fact, near the end of this run, I decided to rewatch Lil Aggie's No Sword playthrough where he used mainly the Simpo arts. With the exception of the Guardian Ape, he praises him for doing a large amount of posture and vitality damage. I don't know if we're playing two different games here, but my experience begs to differ. Anyway, after a couple of tries, I throw in the towel and bust it out the heavy artillery, Mortal Draw. I don't know if it was ever patched, but if you do it in the air, it has the same damage as the Empowered Mortal Draw variant. And it shows, absolutely shredding the Ape's health bar. Even without Spirit Emblems, it still hits like a truck. As expected, it is more than enough to topple King Kong, and that's another boss down. Shame I had to do that art so early, but it's probably fine. Not like there's any other large boss that would be difficult to bring down without reliable damage or nothing. Oh, it would seem the castle is under siege. Someone should really step in and stop that from happening. Oh, that someone is me? This vile hand fight is one of my least favorite encounters in the whole game, so I was dreading it since the beginning. Normally, I just puppet the ad in the room and we 2v1 the mini boss, but I can't do that here, so I get to rely on the age old tactic of kite around in big circle until there's an opening. It actually goes insanely well. I got poisoned at some point, but I couldn't lose focus. The enemy was in front of me, not within. And against all odds, I rose victorious on my first try. What do you mean this boss is optional? On the rooftop, I meet up with dear old dad who politely asked me to indiscriminately murder everything with a pulse. At first, I wasn't sure, but how can I say no to that face, really? Emma the Gentle Blade. This is a phenomenal fight that is unfortunately tied to the bad ending. Well, I say unfortunate, but I'm glad it is because I don't want to have to fight her. Feels bad, man. What I mean is that the fight feels like a beautiful dance. Except in this case, she's an elegant performer, and I'm like the guy that's seven whiskeys deep hoping to impress her. I was determined to get rid of my Simpo combat arts. What I once thought was a blessing of having four different kinds so easily accessible turned into a curse of having them all being awful. That being said, Emma has almost no posture, so even with the subpar attack, she goes down pretty easy. For some reason, I thought she and Ishin both had separate memories, but they don't, so I decided to just use the same combat art for both. Despite being an old man, Ishin is still a master swordsman. The first phase is mostly uneventful. The only thing I have to watch out for is that if I attack him in neutral, he will likely dodge and retaliate. The second phase is where things heat up, pun intended. His amazing full arena firestorm attack I was initially worried about because praying strikes isn't enough to knock him out of it. However, I quickly realized if you deflect the first two, you can just sidestep one mine and get free back shots in. That's not something I ever wanted to say while talking about Ishin, but hey, here we are. He also has this huge uppercut fire sword slash thing, which again can be handled just by running around to his side. At the end of the fight, things got a little crazy. He did that uppercut slash, but I'm against a wall. I managed to iframe jump through it, bounce on his head, get smacked, and dodge around his Ichimonji, which allows me to burst his kidney, winning the fight. I really like how Wolf kills Owl, and Owl is legitimately confused as to why Wolf would betray him, only to realize he is the one that released his unspeakable evil on the land. If only there was a way to go back in time and stop it from happening. Oh wait, there is. Through the power of save stating, I face Owl once again, but this time decline his offer leading to the Great Shinobi Owl encounter. I opted to go for the base praying strikes here for the same reason I did with the exorcism one with Ishin, mostly to get rid of it. Also, if you were wondering, despite rewinding time, I'm not going to use exorcism going forward. Phase 1 Owl, I was able to find three safe opportunities to attack. The obvious one is when he does his big front flip slash. It's unbelievably easy to dodge to the side and hit him. Second is when he throws a shuriken and follows it up with a big sweep. With a well-timed dodge, you can iframe through the sword and hit him. Last is after his four-hit combo where he spins around. You can also really easily hit him when he throws his heal-stopping charm, but there is a chance he'll be afflicted, so it's not worth it in the long run. Phase 2 is the same as far as attack opportunities, but I forgot one crucial thing about this fight. Owl can recover posture. The first time it happened, I just had to watch from afar as he undid all of my hard work. The second time, I decided to just sprint through the poison and knock him out of it. This actually almost cost me the fight as the poison chipped away at my health until I was almost dead and he finished me off. 
Fortunately, I can just get right back up and after a few more arm thrusts, he falls. At this point, I'm closing in on the end of the game, so I figured I would do the steps necessary to set up the good ending and the secret owl fight. All that really means is I spent a lot of time talking to NPCs and resting, as most of the steps, like collecting the book for the Divine Child, I did on the way there. The only real work I had to do was getting the Serpent Viscera, but since I also want to do the Super Owl fight, it means I need to clear out Lady Butterfly. I opted to go for Shadow Rush here because I 100% did not want to use that against dear old dad. It actually does a surprising amount of damage, though that might be because I'm fighting her so late in a playthrough, I'm not sure. Phase 2, she summons those illusionary minions and my strategy to handle them was run away in big circles until she thanos them out of existence. Weird, I remember Lady Butterfly giving me so much trouble the first time I was here. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Back on track, I go to Fountainhead Palace and confront the true monk. My options for combat arts is starting to look a little thin, and by that I mean I have like two left right now, so Nightjar slash Reversal it is. Phase 1 is actually ridiculously easy. The reason being, the backflip can outspace her swings. Like, I'm in so little danger during this encounter, it's not even funny. Phase 2 starts and it took all my discipline not to plunge down on her, instead I just leap around the tree branches. Aside from that one attack though, I don't think anything else has changed here. It's kinda weird to me that she even has a phase 2. Also, it was here that I tried to test if you can use the reverse version in midair, but Wolf flips forward telling me it's acting like the normal one. That's really good information to have, except that it won't matter after this fight. Phase 3 was a little bit more deadly. She gets this massive overhead slam, which was too fast to be able to safely jump away from. Luckily, I noticed that after she does it, there is plenty of time to get a swing in. Also, Nightjar Slash Reversal usually outspaces the bug spray, which is great because Terror is a stupid mechanic. I think this is the first time I've ever fully depleted the monk's health bar. Oh well, whatever works, I guess. Hey, uh, how's it going? Do you mind if I just... I I'm just gonna get out of the water, okay? I'm not sure how many people know this in this, you know, like, five-year-old game, but these Miss Nobles will respawn as long as you don't open the door. They're worth 210 experience apiece, meaning you can get roughly 1,000 experience in about 20 seconds. It's not the fastest place to farm, but it's not bad either. I spend some time here just until I can get Ichimoji double unlocked, then I head up and into the Divine Realm. Huh. Maybe this is actually hell, I'm not sure. Why can't From Software ever make the Dragon Covenant look like an actual dragon? Well, whatever. I decided to use Ichimonji Double here, and it was a terrible choice. First, it's a vertical attack, so even though they are bunched together, I can only hit one at a time. And second, charged or uncharged, two hits is just barely not enough to break their stance, but I really wanted to hold on to Whirlwind Slash because it had been so good to me. After a six and a half minute long Phase 1 Dragon Fight, I move on to Phase 2. Oh, we might have a problem. Okay, it's time to address the dragon in the room. This boss makes this run impossible. The only way to damage it is by redirecting lightning, and you're not able to do a combat art while channeling lightning. I actually had the foresight to try and prepare for this. Sakura Dance allows you to perform lightning reversal. It can even be done without jumping. However, I tested on a different character to see if you could actually do that here, and you can't. Wolf just kinda hangs out in the air for a second before dropping back down to the ground. Normally, in these runs, I'm willing to give the gimmick boss a pass, and I'm going to do that here as well, it's just unfortunate that Sakura Dance doesn't work. It's actually the reason I was originally thinking about doing this run on New Game Plus, so I could pull out the haha, you thought it was the end, but it was actually me, Sakura Dance card. Interestingly, this boss is actually what makes the run both impossible and possible. It's Schrodinger's challenge run, basically. Should you choose to do any ending that is in Shuda, the run is incompletable. But if you choose the Shuda ending and let the Snake Eyes enemy at the beginning of the game net you the first skill point, it is 100% doable. So I guess I technically lied at the beginning of the video when I said this was impossible. Well, no matter, I've come this far and there's no giving up now. With a few thunderbolts to the face, the Divine Dragon and Ichimoji Double are now dead. Ah, Hirata State. Feels like I was only here three years ago, yesterday, tomorrow, next week. Time is convoluted in feudal Japan. So how come Sekiro is the only game in FromSoft's lineup that I can't hit enemies through walls, but they can still hit me? This is dumb. Owl Father with Ichimonji is probably the easiest time I've ever had fighting him. The attack opportunities are a little different than last time. The big slash can now be dodged through for a hit, but now he has this rolling attack where he charges up a big overhead slam. Again, just dodge to the side and punish. But don't dodge too early, otherwise he'll switch it up and go for a side swing. A new chance to attack is after he does his close range firecrackers. You can dodge to his left through the sword and hit him. There's also enough time to try after he shadow rushes, but in my experience he'll frequently jump out of the way. Some of the times he would just deflect it, which I guess is good for keeping up pressure. Phase 2 is the same, except now he will sometimes owl transform away at the end of a combo causing an Ichimonji whiff. It's not really a problem, it just drags the fight out longer. I did figure out near the end that it's possible to get a mid-air combat art off after he reappears from Alform. 
It looks kind of jank, but if it works, am I right? With that, dear old dad is dead. Uh, re-dead in the past. I don't know how this works, honestly. All right, I know I skipped him earlier, but I can't not do the duo ape fight. I decided on Ashina Cross for this encounter, which in addition to doing a ludicrous amount of damage is one of the coolest looking combat arts in the whole game. Phase one was over after like six attacks or something. It's on par with Mortal Draw and that's actually stupid. Overall, the fight was going great, right up until the game didn't register my death blow and I hit the ape normally, meaning I had to die and reset. Thanks game, I'm so happy to do this fight again. Well, whatever, it's annoying, but like I said, this attack is so ungodly powerful, it's more of a time waster than anything, and after just a couple of minutes, the ape is re un -re -dead for the first time for the final time. Two bosses left, and I just wish I didn't have to do one of them. I farm the Albert Arcs for a while until I have 9 skill points, grab a prayer bead, buy the fire cord, then finally unlock Cloud Spiral Passage. This is basically floating passage, except with more shockwaves. My hope is that each of these hits do a decent amount of damage, that way I can quickly cut the Demon of Hatred's health bar down. You wanna take a wild guess if that's what's gonna happen or not? Okay, here we go. My previously most hated encounter turns somewhat likable. So the biggest issue is that, despite being the largest enemy in the game, he's pretty fast. Except for when he staggers, I can only get the first one or two hits of the combo off. The good news is, when he does stagger, it's a chance to absolutely shred his health bar. But the other more pressing issue is that he can basically sneeze and wipe out 75% of my health bar. And he's a three phase fight. Conclusion, Spiral Cloud Passage, more like Spiral Cloud Assage. Fortunately, I kind of figured this would happen, so I made a backup save before dumping all my levels. Now I just gotta farm a little more until I can buy Empowered Mortal Draw. Oh yeah, that's the good stuff. To be honest, at this point, it wasn't much of a fight. Empowered Mortal Draw does like the same amount of damage Spiral Cloud Passage does, except at a fraction of the time commitment. Phase 1 and 2 are uneventful, it's just a matter of picking when to swing at him and if I should commit to both swings or just one. Phase 3 was kinda new for me. I always use Malcontent to stop him from doing his Johnny Cash attack, so I actually had to learn how to deal with it, but aside from that, not much has changed. There is one thing I want to point out about this run that I haven't really had a good chance to bring up, so I'm just going to shoehorn it in here. I'm sure you might have noticed that a lot of the combat arts are just a different art, but more. For example, Spiral Cloud Passage is just better floating passage, Empowered Mortal Draw is just jumping regular Mortal Draw, and so on. Originally, I had thought to do this challenge without any duplicate combat arts, and by my count, there are 9 mandatory bosses in the non-shooter ending, including the Divine Dragon. There are 19 total combat arts, but 3 of those are locked behind beating the game at least once. Then, if we remove the duplicates, there are exactly 9 unique ones, meaning there is 1 combat art per boss. So I did think about doing the run this way, but I really wanted to fight the hard optional bosses. Speaking of, Demon of Hatred is no more, and with that, it is time to bring this challenge to its final form. The greatest of foes stands in my way. Also Genichiro. I love how he goes from being imposing at the beginning to a near literal speed bump at the end. Anyway, I decided the only way to close out this challenge is with none other than Whirlwind Slash. This combat art has been by my side since the beginning, carrying me through thousands of Mibu villagers and practically every mini boss that stood in my way. Will it shape up against Ishin the Sword Saint? Let's hope so. Most of my strategies still work here, with one exception. The normal sword swing is enough to interrupt his 3 hit combo, but here Whirlwind Slash is too slow so I have to wait for it to finish. Aside from that, phase 1 is normal. Phase 2, the only issue I ran into is his big leaping sweep with the spear. Whirlwind Slash is just slow enough to not let me deflect or dodge. The way around this though is to just wait until he does it, dodge in, Whirlwind Slash, and then deflect until he does it again. I get pretty greedy and pretty lucky though with him not doing it so frequently. Finally, Phase 3 is, well, a bit harder than normal. It's just Phase 2 plus Lightning, and normally that would make it free, but here I can't redirect it at him as it's not a combat art. For the most part, I just dodge out of the way of it, but there was one instance where I knew I wouldn't be able to get away in time, so instead I jumped and took the hit while unlocking the camera and firing lightning in some random direction. It caused me to get shot in the back a couple times, but that's fine. I cannot praise From Software enough for this fight, it is actually a masterpiece. It tests the player over everything the game has been trying to teach you, and if you aren't ready for him, he's going to absolutely smear the pavement with you, and I love every second of it. With a final whirlwind slash to the back, Ishin falls and I have beaten Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice, with only combat arts. Sort of. Close enough. Thank you everyone for watching and an extra special thanks to my patrons, stay beautiful y'all. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving a like and subscribing, it really helps the channel out, and why not check out the time I beat Sekudo at base vitality. That was... painful. Like, really painful. But until next time my friends, remember... Mayoeba. Yabureru.